Romans chapter 1. We're going to be there again today and uh, continue to talk about the basically the introduction to Paul's letter to the Romans. But I want you to stop and think about something. You know, when I was in my previous life, there was this issue that they always talked about, something that was a no-no, something that you couldn't do, and it was called profiling. Can't do that, right? Can't profile. How many of us as Christians profile? Stop thinking about it now. I don't want to be, I don't want to be too hard on you here. And you got to always remember that, that. But I've done a lot of praying and I've had to do a lot of asking forgiveness before I preach these sermons. Okay? Uh, because the things that I talk about and the things that I preach about are things that I have dealt with, okay, that I am still maybe dealing with. And I, I thought about it as, as the week went on. I, you know, I put this, I, I, this, this title of this sermon called The Whole Gospel. I probably should have put The Whole World, okay, because that's what the gospel is for. It is for the whole world. But we sometimes as Christians tend to think that God... Uh, only came and died and rose again to save a certain group. And folks, heaven help us if we ever get to that point because that ain't true. <laughs> it just slap ain't true. Now you stop and look at Scripture. Where was the first time that the plan of salvation was even mentioned in Scripture? And it was in Genesis when God spoke to Adam and Eve. You remember after Adam and Eve sinned and they fell from grace and they had to leave? You know, God told them that he had already worked out a plan for them to regain heaven because pretty much they were living on this earth in the Garden of Eden. But folks, let me tell you, from what I have read about the Garden of Eden, it was heaven. You know why? Because there was no sin and everything was perfect. Amen. Okay? And, and that's where we're headed as Christians one day. We're headed to heaven where there is no sin and everything is perfect and we will be able to commune with God. We'll walk with God. We'll talk to God just like Adam and Eve did. Folks, that's a wonderful thought. That's something that we really ought to be looking forward to. But listen, don't ever get to the point where you think that God only offers his salvation to one group of people and that they got to fit a certain mold to, to be saved, because that ain't true. Look, in, in, when, when God was first talking about the plan of salvation, he started crossing different lines that we make distinctions with. Okay, stop and think about it. When he was talking to Adam and Eve, what kind of, what kind of barrier was he tearing down? Well, there's this thing called gender. There's men and there's women. Okay? I ain't going to say it. There's men and there's women. Amen. Okay? Amen. There's men and there's women. And God said, you know what? I died and I provided salvation for women just like I did for men and for men just like I did for women. He started taking down those barriers, didn't he? Well, you move along in Scripture, and I'm moving kind of fast here, but you get to the book of Daniel, and you had two groups of people. You had the Jews and you had the Babylonians. They pretty much didn't get along. You remember that? But you know what? God made it clear to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people in the book of Daniel, that not only was salvation available to them, but salvation was also available to the Babylonians. Amen. Now here, see, we start, we start to tear down some national boundaries now, aren't we? That's what God was doing. But I'm going to throw another little question in here that may kind of hit at the heart some. Uh, you know that God wants to save your enemies just as bad as he wanted to save you. Now that's hard, that's hard for us, isn't it? That's hard for us. So you know what? That's why God said, pray for your enemies. Pray for them. I have found that if you pray for them, it kind of eases up the animosity a little bit. God has a way of working that out. But you know what? We move on forward when Christ was here on earth. 
What did, what did the religious people say? What did those people who thought God could only come to them, the Jews, you know, the Pharisees and all them, they sat over here and they looked at Christ and they watched him as he sat down to have a meal with people. And what did they say? They said, look, this man sits and eats with publicans and sinners. You know what publicans were? <laughs> Tax collectors. You know what? Some things never change, do they? People don't like tax collectors now either, do they? Look, you know what? Christ sat down with the people that they didn't want to have anything to do with. They said, far be it from us to sit down and eat a meal because, folks, that was, in Christ's day, you just have to understand the custom. In Christ's day, that was one of the, the things that showed that you were close to someone that there was a meaningful relationship with them if you sat down and had a meal together. <laughs> and the, the religious leaders of the day said, look, this man's sitting down with publicans. He's sitting down with sinners. What in the world is this man doing? We don't want to have anything to do with him. But folks, let me tell you something. Christ sat down with him anyway, and he tore down these religious barriers, didn't he? You know what one of the biggest topics in our news today is, in our world today is? Of course, you know it, you keep up with it, and it's, it's uh, Islamist terrorism. And folks, you know what? I've told y'all what I have learned from some people who grew up in countries that were Muslim, and, and their suggestion on how to, to stop this threat. And their suggestion is you, you kill them all. But you know what? Is that what God said? Do you know that God loves them just as much as he loves you? We're starting to tear down some religious barriers here, aren't we? You know what? I've studied all kinds of different religions. And I think, how in the world can somebody believe that? And I think, wow, that person must not be really intelligent. Because, boy, to believe that, if you read the Bible at all, you know, but you know what? God loves those people just as much as he loves them. And God wants those people saved just as much as he wanted me saved. You know what? It, Jesus summed it up real well in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You remember what it says? <laughs> but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Where? Basically, to the whole world. That means everybody. That means everybody. Let's stand as we read where Paul says something. In, in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, listen to what he says. Paul says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Let's pray. Father, teach us. Lord, help us to understand. Lord, thank you for salvation. But Lord, help us to understand that you didn't just die for us, you died for everybody. And Lord, we need to be about your business, and that is telling the world about Jesus Christ and the new life that they can have in him. And Father, we'll praise you for us in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. You see, now I want to tell you something about Paul right here. When, it starts, when he starts right there in verse 14, he said, I'm a debtor. In other words, I have to, I have to go to the Greeks, okay? I'm a, I'm a debtor to the Greeks, but then he also says the barbarians, okay? We're going to get to that. Now, let me tell you something. Paul's not being derogatory here about anybody, all right? He, there, there are basically uh, four groups of people that he talks about. In the, and right there in verse 14, he said the Greeks, the barbarians, and the wise, and the unwise, Okay? He's not being unkind. You have to understand the culture of the day and where he was in that part of the world at that time and what was going on. And so as we go through today, I want you to understand he's not being critical of anybody because of any limitations or, or uh, privileges that they may have had. He's just making the point that I'm supposed to tell everybody, no matter what their station in life, about Jesus Christ. And he said, in one of these days, I'm going to get to Rome and I'm going to preach to you as well. I'm going to tell everybody that I come in contact with about the gospel of Christ. Who is the first uh, group that he talks about? Well, let's kind of mix it up here a little bit. He's, first of all, he says that he needs to preach to the wise people. 
okay, to the wise people. What are we talking about? He's talking about those people, basically, who were educated. Now, who was that group of people? Pretty much the Greeks. Now, I'm going to give you a quick history lesson, one you already know probably, but just to remind us, okay? Listen, <clears throat> the Greeks under Alexander the Great conquered the known world. Okay, they conquered the known world. Well, uh, they ruled for a while, and, and when the Greeks were in power, uh, everything had to be done uh, in the Greek language. If you wanted to do business, you had to speak Greek, okay? They said, look, we rule the world, you're going to do it our way, okay? You're going to speak our language. I've heard that before somewhere, recently as a matter of fact. But listen, he said, you're going to have to do everything like we do it. We're going to have a standardized way of doing it. And one thing we're going to do is we're going to all speak the same language. But let me tell you something about the Greeks. They were great intellectuals, okay? You look at any of the great philosophers, guess where they came from? Greece, okay? Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, all those guys were Greek, right? And uh, by the way, young people and old people alike, y'all know this, I'm a little bit weird. Uh, I kind of like philosophy. It's boring to some people, but I kind of like it because, listen, let me tell you something. Stop thinking about it. Everything in your life, everything you believe, everything you say you stand for, everything in your life is based on a philosophy. You ought to know what it is. I'm just saying. You know what I have found? One of the biggest things that I have found in churches that people criticize more than anything else when they don't want to be involved in church is this. They'll always say to come around to saying something like this. Well, you know what? I got I know somebody that goes to this church over there, and so one day I asked them, Well, what do you believe? And they told me what they believed. They knew what they believed, but then I asked them one more question, they couldn't answer it. And it was, why do you believe that? Why do we believe? Do we believe it just because that's what our parents believe? Or that's what our grandparents believe? Y'all heard the one about the two preachers talking, right? One was Baptist, one was Methodist. My mom ain't here. She's Methodist, so I can say this. <laughs> but mama lived with Baptist preacher for 40 years, so you know. <clears throat> two preachers, Baptist and Methodist, they're talking, right? And, and so, you know, the, the Baptist preacher looks at the Methodist and says, well, you know, why did you decide to become a Methodist? He said, well, you know, I felt God called me into ministry, and I prayed about it, and I prayed about it, and I studied the Word, and I got to looking at the different denominations, and you know, and, and after praying about it, and after studying studying the Word, and after studying, you know, some theology and things like that, I decided that this is the this is where God wanted me, and this is the church that I need to be a part of. This is the one where I felt like I fit. And he said, "Okay, good. Well, that's a good answer." And so the Methodist asked the Baptist. He said, "Well, why are you a Baptist preacher?" He said, "Well, my great granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. My granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. My daddy was a Baptist preacher." So you know what? I just I figured I had to be a Baptist preacher. And the Methodist preacher looked at him and said, Well, that's crazy. You mean you're a Baptist preacher just because your ancestors were a Baptist preacher? He said, What if your great granddaddy had, had been a womanizer, your granddaddy had been a drunk, and your daddy had been a complete idiot? What would you have been then? He said, I'd have been a Methodist preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell people why you believe what you believe? Folks, if you can't, you need to work on that. You know? Folks, look, when, when Paul, when I, when I say that, that, and Paul says here in the, in the scripture that he went to those people who were wise, he was talking about the educated people of his day, and the Greek people were highly, highly educated. Look, they, they uh, spoke a different language. He also talks about the barbarians there, and he says, listen, you know what, there, there's something about this. If you look at the Greek word for, for barbarian, it's barbaros, okay? But the Sanskrit is barbara. And basically, the literal translation of that Greek word that is the root for the word barbarian here is this. Those with inarticulate speech. The Greeks considered everybody that was not a Greek to be uneducated, okay? That was the culture of the day. And so when Paul said barbarians, he's not being critical. He's just saying, look, here's the way it is in culture. There are some people that are, think they're very educated, and they, those same people think that everybody else is not educated. It doesn't matter because the gospel is for everybody. Amen. 
no matter what you're facing in life. That's what Paul was saying here when he started talking about the wise and the unwise. Look, uh, there are some people that they, they get some education and all of a sudden they forget everything they were taught as a child. You know what? There are some people that say, well, you know what? In my sociology class, they taught us that religion was just a crutch. That people who really weren't educated taught, uh, believed in religion because, you know what? Uh, that's just something that they tell themselves and convince themselves so that they can deal with the harsh reality of life. And you know what? And, and there are other people there. There are college professors who even don't believe in, in Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And they will do everything they can with all of their intellect to convince people that there's nothing to this whole thing about Christ and Christ's Word. And I want to ask you a question. Would you rather believe about, or would you rather believe in a person, or would you rather believe, uh, uh, learn about Christ from a person who just has some degrees behind their name, or would you rather learn how to be a Christian and about Christ and about what really brought meaning to life from somebody that may have never gone to school in their life. You know what? I think there's a lot of people that I can remember from my growing up years that were in churches where my daddy passed Look, there were so many of them. And you know what? Some of them never even went to school at all. They were just as illiterate as they could be. But let me tell you something. If I wanted advice about something, I'd go to them first. You know why? Because they trusted Jesus Christ. They had learned how to pray and ask God to lead them and direct them. They had the Holy Spirit in their life, and they always made the right decision. You know why? Because they depended completely upon God. I had a guy tell me one time, I started talking to him about the Lord, and he said he was older than I was, and he looked at me, and he kind of laughed, and he cut his high sideways at me and said, boy, don't you come here with that. I'm too educated to believe all that in my life. And he wouldn't listen to it. I don't know how educated he was or what educated. Okay, I don't know. All I know is that man's dead right now, and unless he changed his heart or God got a hold of him, that man's in hell right now. And all the, quote, wisdom of the world will do you no good once you get there. Because believe me, everybody's equal there. Just like everybody's equal in heaven. The inequality comes in with us, though. Folks, listen. Paul said, I come to the wise, but I also come to the ordinary people. I want to read something to you. I like these verses of Scripture. It's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to read some Scripture to you. Listen to this. Start about, about verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer or the debater of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? I like it. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. The religious people, they needed a sign. Okay? But right here, uh, Paul tells, he said, the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks, what do they do? They seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. That's all we got. I can preach a whole sermon. Mm -hmm. Folks, that's all we're supposed to preach. Christ crucified. He died for us. Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. In other words, when I preach Christ crucified to the Jews, to those religious Jews, they saw it as a stumbling block to their religion. And when I preached it to the Greeks, the educated, intelligent people, they thought I was a fool. That's what he's saying there. Verse 24 says, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, 25 I really like, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let me tell you something. Paul said, look, I was sent to preach to everybody. And the wonderful thing is that those wise people, they can be saved just like the ordinary people, the barbarians, he calls them. But let me tell you something. 
there are a lot of people today who feel disadvantaged because they have a lack of education, or maybe they feel disadvantaged because of their race, or maybe they feel disadvantaged because of their economic status. There's all kinds of things that people feel disadvantaged about. But you know what? The good news is that we can go to those people and say, you know what? Jesus loves you, and you are the kind of person that Jesus came to first. You know, there's a lot of people in this world who think they're better than everybody else. And it could be because they're really smart. And I'm going to tell you something. I admire smart people. I do. I do. I wish I was smart. I wish I was smarter than I am. I wish I had more education than I've got. But let me tell you something. That don't make somebody that's smarter than me better than me in God's eyes. And I thank God for that. You know what God knows? God created me just like I am. God created me and he's happy with me. Let me tell you something. God gave me something to do, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, and God knows my heart, and God knows that I'm going to do that. And you know what? That's enough for God because God loves me. And God loves you. Just like you are, God loves you. And that's the kind of people that Christ came to this world to save. We need to be telling people that God came to save them even though they may be disadvantaged in this life, one day they're going to be really advantaged in heaven. Because you know what? Even in heaven, the most foolish is wiser than anything in this earth. He just said it in verse 25. Folks, let me tell you something. I want to read something else. You continue in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to this. <clears throat> For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now what does that say? Is that, you know, there's some people that use that verse to go on about this predestination thing and God said, well, yeah, you know, I pick, and I just don't pick that many people who are mighty and who are wise and who are called. That ain't what that's saying. Let me tell you what this is saying. Those mighty people, those wise people and all that, God says because they have those advantages here, they don't see the need for a Savior. And folks, we need to let them know that they need a Savior. We need to be telling them. Verse, 26 says, uh, verse 27 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. Oh, I like that. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. That right there tells me I'm worth something in God's eyes. And I'm useful to God. Because he, he can use even the weak. And He can use the unwind. Look at verse 28. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yes, and these things which are not to bring to naught those that are that no flesh should glory in His presence. Let me tell you something, folks. God came for everybody. But there's another class of people that Paul wrote about and that God wants us to think about. He talks about the wise and the unwise. He talks about the Greek and the barbarians. But let me tell you something. There's another group right here. If we look, uh, he, he came to the religious people. He starts talking about the Jews. Okay? They were the religious people. They were the ones who had the religion of the day. They were the ones who were in power as far as religion goes. And Paul says, look, it don't matter if you're Greek. It don't matter if you're not Greek. It doesn't matter if you're wise. It doesn't matter if you're foolish. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew. Look, the Jews resisted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Why? I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, it's because they started losing control. The ones who controlled everything started to lose control. And let me tell you, when that starts happening, all people go into the fighting stance, don't they? Boy, when they start to lose control, they don't like it. I've seen it in churches. I've experienced it in churches. Let me tell you something. It is a very unpleasant thing when God's house is torn apart because there are some people who feel like they have to control everything when it's not their place to begin with. You know what? I think the Jews felt threatened by Christ because they were losing control. But you know what I think the biggest thing was? Is he changed their traditions. Is there anything wrong with tradition? Not in and of itself, no. No. 
I think there are some traditions that are wonderful in the Baptist church. I think we should keep them up. You know what? We got a tradition in our church of having an Easter sunrise service. I think that's a good tradition. I want to keep seeing that happen. I think that's a very moving time. I am excited about it. But folks, let me tell you something. When we put traditions before Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the work that he wants to do, we are wrong. Amen. Folks, may we never, ever, ever let tradition stand in the way of Christ working in his church. The Jews, they, did, they resisted because Christ was changing their traditions and they didn't like it. We have traditions today. But what we have to remember is this. Traditions can't save you. Religion can't save you. I keep saying it. Folks, I'm not religious. I'm a Christian. Religion will send you to hell. But Christ won't if you accept it. It's plain and simple. It's easy to understand. Listen, but he also talks to everybody. Paul said he was including everybody in this. You know what? He says to you people at Rome there in, in one. He said in chapter, uh, chapter 1 in Romans, he says, I want to also come to you at Rome and preach the good news of the gospel to you as well. You see, the gospel is for everybody everywhere. And I guess in our culture today, we make... One real big distinction, I know I have been faced with it in the recent past. <clears throat> my son the other day, the oldest one, you know, he looked at me and said, look, old man. And he was cutting up. I sort of took offense. <laughs> I turned around and I said, let me tell you something, boy. I said, number one, I might be older than you, but I'm still your daddy. And I still got a belt. And I said, before you go throwing that old word around, might I remind you, you ain't far away from 40, son. You ain't young as you used to be. <laughs> I said, you better be careful how you throw that around. But I've talked to young people, and you know what? There are a lot of young people that say, you know what? I got my whole life ahead of me. I got time to do business with God later on. Let me tell you something. It don't matter how young you are. It don't matter how young you are, you're old enough to sin and you're old enough to die. Now that sounds hard, don't it? Really, it does. That sounds hard. Nobody likes to think about that. Let me tell you something. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today. Don't put it off because you don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. Let me tell you something. I, I remember something my daddy said one time, and I kind of like this philosophy. He said this. He said, you know what? I hope I live to 100 years old, get real sick, get real well, and live by 100 years. I, I ain't itching to go because I'm enjoying life right now. But you know what? If I go tomorrow, it's okay. It's okay. Because I know where I'm at. But here's the thing. We don't know when we're going there. Paul said, look, it, it don't matter if you're educated or uneducated. It don't matter if you are a wise person or an unwise person. It don't matter if you're a religious person. It don't matter if you're a young person. And it don't matter if you're an older person. The gospel is for you. You know, I've talked to older people who said, you know what, God can't forgive me. I've lived my whole life. And I hadn't lived it for God. Why would I think God can save me now? I always tell them this, look, God loves you enough that all you got to do while there's breath in your body is say, Lord, I'm a sinner, save me, and he will do it just like that. There is time as long as you're breathing. There is time. Folks, let me tell you something. We got to understand that what we're going to celebrate next Sunday is all about this right here. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does that gospel mean? It simply means this. God loves you. God loves you enough to send his only son to die on the cross and shed his blood. Stop and think about it. 
That was God's blood that was spilled so that you could be saved and you could have eternal life. That's what it's about. Now, I thought about this. Christ and Scripture all the way through talks about all these barriers that Christ broke down when he was telling about salvation. Gender, nationality, religion, every other kind of barrier. God did away with that, didn't he? He did away with it on the cross. And you say, well, I just don't believe that. I just don't believe God, you know, is, could save these people or these people. Let me tell you something. I thought about when they crucified Christ and he was hanging there on that cross. Okay? As bad as it was, there were two other people dying at the same time. You know what? Christ was perfect. Christ never did anything wrong. Christ had never committed a sin. He'd never broken the law. But the two people dying next to him were criminals. They were criminals. We kind of look down on those folks. Why? We don't know anything about those two criminals that were dying at the same time Christ was. I've read the accounts. I read them again this week. I looked at every gospel, okay? The only thing that we know about those two men that were hanging on the cross with Christ up there is this. Number one, <laughs> They were dying like Christ. They were being crucified. We know that they were criminals. We don't know what nationality they were. We don't know how old they were. We don't know anything about them except that they were criminals and they were dying. But we know this, God loved them and God saved one of them right before he died. Amen. That's what we know about. We look down on people who are in prison and we think, how can that, you know, I, I've always, and God help me, you know, you've always heard about jailhouse conversions. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Don't doubt God. Amen. Don't doubt God. Let me tell you something. Maybe God put them there to get their attention. And you know what? If that's the case, as long as God got a hold of their heart and they gave their heart to God, praise God. Amen. Praise God. Folks, let me tell you something. Don't limit God. Paul said right there when he was writing to the Romans, he said, one day I'm going to come to you and one day I'm going to preach to you, but let me tell you who I'm preaching to in the meantime. I'm preaching to everybody that will listen. Folks, that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. That's our job. That's what the Great Commission is all about. Tell people about Jesus Christ. Because he's the only thing worth preaching about. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Our musicians are going to come. In a minute, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. But I want you to ask yourself the question, have I done business with God? Am I saved? Am I saved? Folks, let me tell you something. If you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus Christ your Savior, I want you to know that God loves you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you grew up. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. It, don't, it, it doesn't depend on anything but you just asking Christ to save you. That's all that matters. Let me tell you something. Christ will save you. And I beg you this morning, open your heart and let God come in. Let him cleanse your life. Let him give you peace. Let him give you joy. Maybe this morning we're here we might be a little bit guilty of being religious and limiting God and saying that God can't save these, these people or those people. Let me tell you something. 
folks, if we have that in our heart, we got to get rid of it. If that's the way we feel, maybe we need to ask God for forgiveness and get him to change our heart. And then maybe this morning, you just need the strength of God to go out and, and be a witness to all people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that God is dealing with you about, you need to let him work in your heart. Father, this morning, we thank you, we praise you for who you are. God, I thank you for your word, and I ask that you would help us to be the Christians you want us to be. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I pray that if there are those here this morning that need uh, you to work in their life, Father, you work, you work, you do your work in their life, and I pray that they would open their heart to you, and they would do whatever it is that you're asking them to do. Father, we'll praise you for it. It's in your name we pray. Amen.